And if you could open up in the Word of God in 2 Kings chapter 18, the book of 2 Kings, uh, the 18th chapter, we've been doing a topical series on revival, dealing with the matter of revival and various uh, elements, I'm trying to do it somewhat progressively, dealing with foundation and building up um, uh, various ways we can look at this topic. And we come now to deal with the purging. There's a purging that is required, purging that is necessary. And we have that wonderfully exemplified here in Second Kings chapter 18. So, I want to give our minds to the Word of God here for the time that remains. And we're going to read from verse 1, 2 Kings chapter 18, and the first verse. Now it came to pass, in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places, and brake the images, and cut down the groves, and brake in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord, and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and served him not. He smote the Philistines even unto Gaza, and the borders thereof, from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced city. Amen. Ending there at the end of verse 8. We want to bow before the Lord again briefly, momentarily, with a final cry for the Spirit to come and really apply the truths that we need to hear in the Word today. Lord, we have been challenged by what has preceded this point. The need for us to consider the importance of Thy Word in the psalm that we sang, and also the need to present ourselves before Thee to surrender all. Lord, teach us what it means to surrender all. We are so prone to deceive ourselves and to be content thinking that we are in a place that is okay, we're, we're fine, and we're quite comfortable with the level of devotion that we express to Thee. But Lord, we ask Thee to unsettle us, remove us out of some false comfort and complacency, and daily stir us to seek the Lord. We pray that presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice would be a daily thing, coming before Thee with purpose of mind to give ourselves entirely that whatever He wants of me, I will do. Wherever He sends me, I will go. We are entirely devoted to the cause, to the Word of our God and our Savior. And as we see here exemplified in this portion, a man that we can learn much from, we pray that with regard particularly to the need for purging, thy Spirit will apply this truth and help us to see that there can be no life to the individual, no revival to the church, no outpouring of the Spirit without the purging of those things that are unclean. So help us to obey the Word when we hear it. And may the Spirit give us grace so to do. Fill me now with the Holy Ghost, with wisdom, grace, and love. Help me to be faithful and to exalt Christ and to be true in the presentation of the Word now. And just hallow this hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. While Hezekiah was by no means a perfect man, and he wasn't, if you read through the history and record of his life, you will find that he had his faults and had his failures through his life, yet we are given an overview 
of his testimony in verse 3 that we read. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father did. And this is the general testimony. This is the Lord's view. This is the record of the Holy Spirit concerning the man, Hezekiah, the king of Judah. And you know, we can do no better than to have that kind of a testimony if it was to be said of each of us when we go to glory that we did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, I think we would be well content, that we would be satisfied that to some degree we have received the well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And this ought to be the desire of the child of God. It cannot be that one that is regenerate one who has the Spirit of God could continue on without any kind of longing to receive well done, to receive the kind of divine testimony spoken of us that we did that which was right while we were upon the earth. I don't think so. Surely we must be in a very poor spiritual condition if there is not some kind of longing to have this testimony. Our failures ought to be most evident to ourselves. We must be aware of them daily and ought to lead us to daily repentance. And yet we ought not to be discouraged because when he is exemplified here, uh, not merely that it stated that he did that which was right, it's, it's compared to another life, the life of David. And of course it's framed in a positive light. And if we know the life of David, we know that he too had his failures. He didn't live perfectly and we're aware of his downfall, and we should be aware of it. Not that we might disdain David and kind of cast him off as some disaster of example of the Christian life. Far be it from us to do that. The Spirit of God, even here in this text, is framing the whole message in light of positivity. David lived in a way that was positively devoted to God. And so we ought not to be bound and fettered by the memory of our failures. There are far too many believers who live life bound and chained by the memory of failure, and it ought not to be the case. If it was the case that that was the will of God for you, David could not be elevated as an example, nor should he be compared as one who lived godly uh, for the rest who come after him. Hezekiah did that which was right, and in doing that, he did that which was according to all that David did. Because largely speaking, though David had clay feet and failed the Lord, yet he was a man after God's own heart. And so, we are never without sin. And the problem isn't so much that of the existence of sin, as I said a couple of weeks ago, it is the absence of repentance. We are to be a penitent people, recognizing our daily, daily failures, coming penitently before God, and not saying, well, because I made that failure, now I can't do anything for God. That's a lie. A lie perhaps you want to believe to abscond your duty to live for God, or a lie that the devil whispers in your ear, and you believe when you ought not. I know people who have done powerful things for God in the past, and yet are fettered by a feeling of failure because of a blip, a period of sin. And so they don't go forward even after the repentance from that fall. Hezekiah's father was not exemplary for him. Ahaz was a man who was wretched, did wretched things and disobeyed God as much as his heart could carry him. And so he had not an example before him of what it is to be a good and godly king, what it is to lead the people in a right way. No, Hezekiah didn't have that. Hezekiah was much like many young people today. Their example within the home is not one to follow. Nevertheless, God, in his grace and mercy, because grace doesn't flow through the blood, grace is given by God's sovereign electing love and his mercy. He applies it wheresoever he wills, and he gives grace. And in God, in his mercy and his purpose, gave tremendous grace to Hezekiah so that he wasn't fettered by feelings of, of, of not knowing how to live the life that God would have him to live. He stepped aside from the example of his father and walked in the ways of the Lord and the Word of God became his example and his stay. We're told in verse 5 that he trusted in the Lord God of Israel. A, pass, a little 
text or phrase that we can pass over and not give much thought to, and yet it gives us something of the very fundamental of his life. This was how he lived. Hezekiah lived as one who trusted in the Lord God of Israel. He rested in him. He depended upon him. And most here this morning would say the same. You say that I, I trust in the Lord. You say that. And yet, what is remarkable to me is that so many, when it comes to the practical affairs of living the Christian life, they don't seem to trust the Lord. They entrust God with their souls, but they won't trust Him to provide bread on the table. And that ought not to be the way, beloved. The, the idea here, the general testimony, the gist that's being given here of Hezekiah's life can be kind of summarized in this way. He trusted in the Lord. And that should be the summary of your life too. That you trust in the Lord. I mean, could it be? Is that your example? Is that how others may refer to you? I know that individual. They trust in the Lord. And no matter what comes at them, no matter what challenges life brings their way, you can see it, that they're always turning and trusting in the Lord. That is to be our example, our way of living. He also cleaved to the Lord. This steps up a notch in verse 6. He cleaved to the Lord. And that also is to be something we are to do. We are to bind ourselves to the Lord. The idea is of one who didn't just profess to be a believer, but one who bound himself to God, bound himself to his word, and diligently followed God with his entire heart. This is a man of purpose. And this isn't something just for kings and those who are in leadership, pastors, people in places of prominence. The Word of God calls us all as believers to cleave to Him. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20, we read, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God. Him shalt thou serve, and to Him shalt thou cleave and swear by His name. So it's the duty of every professing believer to follow the example of Hezekiah summarized here in giving this word, he cleave to the Lord. Do you cleave to the Lord? Is that how you live your life? Is that how you enter into each day? Is that what you do whenever you, you are tossed about with the, the issues that you face within your life? Health issues, work issues, uh, relational issues. Do you cleave to the Lord? Or do you cleave to your phone and tell everybody else about it and cleave to some other person you depend upon in times of need other than the Lord? I don't know. The idea here is to cling to God. Always, at all times, all occasions, cleaving to the Lord. Now, as we progress here and make some application from this passage, as we've said already, we're dealing with the purging of revival. And we want to understand this, first of all, by thinking of the reason for the purging. The reason why is there a need for purging when we think about revival? Why deal with the topic of purging when we're dealing with the topic of revival? What is the relevance? Well, before there's ever revival, there must be a dealing with sin. And in essence, that's what purging is. It's the removal of sin or removal of that which offends the Lord. But there's a number, of a, way, a number of ways in which the Bible speaks about purging, and I want you to understand these different ways. First of all, uh, purging, we understand, is necessary in, re in regeneration. Purging is necessary in regeneration. The word purge is often used in Scripture not to describe what we do, but to describe what the Lord does. Something that is in His hands, in His control, is His prerogative. And so it's something that He has done that relates to the sacrificial and atoning death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take, for example, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, speaking of the Lord Jesus, he's this tremendous text, and I, I, the mind boggles how anyone can deny the deity of Jesus Christ if they would ever just read and think about what they're reading here in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, who being the brightness of His, that's God's glory, and the express image of His, that's God's person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus Christ comes as the brightness of God's glory, as express image of his person, and he purges our sins and sits down. Of course, it's referring to the cross. I don't think we need too much explanation there. It's kind of summarizing his work. Jesus Christ came as the image of God, and he purged our sins. He went to Calvary's cross to die there, the just for the unjust, to bleed as the Lamb of God by the shedding of that blood to give remission for sin and so purge our sins. 
So purging is necessary and regeneration because if we are ever to enter into true spiritual life, we must believe in that. Is not that right? Is not the first truth that you embrace? Is not what you really rest upon when you come to Christ? It is the understanding that I'm a sinner and Jesus Christ by his death purges sin. That's the hope for our eternity, isn't it? It should be. I hope it is. I hope there's not anyone here today and you're resting in something other than the work of Jesus Christ who purges sin. How are you going to purge your own sin? Don't be so foolish. Don't even try. Religious ceremony, baptism or otherwise, nothing can purge you from sin. At best, they can merely give emblematic messages as to what is needed in the heart. But it is the blood of Christ and resting in the finished work of God's dear Son that purges us from sin. So this is his work on our behalf in order for us to be regenerate. But the purging is necessary also in restoration. When we come to Psalm 51, we're given the account of David's uh, restoration to the Lord. He has spent some, about a year or so, uh, really outside the mind and will of God. You know what preceded that, I am sure. His sin with Bathsheba, his sin then desiring to cover that up by calling Uriah out from battle to go and hopefully lie with his wife so to cover his own sin. That doesn't work out. And then he has to orchestrate the murder of Uriah. You know the story. Horrendous scene in the life of such a godly man. And after a year or so, Nathan comes and says, Thou art the man, and he repents. And we're given that penitence in the 51st Psalm. And there, as he is endeavoring to get back to be right with God, longing to be restored to have the joy of God again within his heart. What does he pray in verse 7? He says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. And the idea of being purged with hyssop brings us to the Passover. For you see at the Passover that was instituted there in Exodus chapter 12, while they were still in Egypt, they were to take hyssop and they were to sprinkle the blood of the lamb upon the, the, the outside of their, their door, the, the lentil on the doorposts of their homes. Uh, and they were to do that as, as a symbol of the fact that they were trusting in the blood of the sacrifice of another, even the lamb, but they were looking forward to what Abel and all the rest of them looked forward to, the fact that God would send one to die on their behalf and be a sacrifice that was well-pleasing in God's sight. They're resting in that. And so by that, by that application of the blood, they get then this guarantee of being delivered from the judgment and the judgment passing over them. That's what it is to be purged. And David is longing for that. He's praying for that. Purge me with hyssop. I have the judgment pass over me, Lord. I want to be purged from that that deserves the judgment of God. Remove it from me. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Purging, purging is also necessary in reformation. Not only re regeneration and restoration, but reformation. And this is the purging that we're dealing with here in 2 Kings chapter 18 and the life of Hezekiah, at least at the beginning of his life. He does a purging work and it's not regenerate. It's not him being regenerate. He, he is saved already. And it's not even him being restored to the Lord because he's walking with God. It's another type of purging. It's the purging of the things that offend God. It's a, a reforming purging. And we are called to do that. We are called to do that on a corporate basis. We're also called to do it on an individual basis. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 7, we read, Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. And this is a message to the church at Corinth. It's a corporate message. They're to purge out the leaven. Get rid of the sin, the problem. That individual that's there in your church, you're not disciplining. You must purge it out. It is necessary. You can't brush sin under the carpet. Dear church, purge out the leaven. But it applies individually as well. And when Paul's writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21, he says to him, if a man therefore purge himself from these, those are the things he's mentioned before, things that are dishonorable, uh, things that uh, we ought not to be engaged in, purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So how are you to be a vessel unto honor? How are you to be prepared unto every good work, dear child of God? You must purge yourself from things that are dishonorable. Purge yourself from that which is not good in the sight of God. 
All of these aspects of purging are vital. We can't ignore any of them. If any are absent, then there'll be, there'll be a want within our spiritual lives. And so, while we may understand the first two, I think, best, and we understand regeneration and restoration, we've been through that, I think. You know, if we're saved here, we've been regenerate. We've, we've had that kind of purging, the application of the purging work of Jesus Christ to justify us. And we've also perhaps been restored because we've been backslidden and we've gotten away from God at times and we've had to come back penitently to the Lord. And we would desire that restoring, the, the joy of our salvation, the, the removal of the hindrance. And we've been through that. But there's, there's a deeper work of purging. It's this reforming work. And so we move then to our second main point, the reform in purging. Not only the reason for it, but the reform. It must be said that it's easier to have a desire to do what Hezekiah did than to live how Hezekiah lived. <laughs> the problem we have when we examine godly men, whether they be godly men in the Bible or godly men in church history, the problem we have is that we admire them and we know all about them and we know how they lived, but we won't live how they lived. And we admire what they did, but we won't do what they did. And this is me as well. I am included there. When I read of men of the past, I fall horribly short, not of understanding how they lived. I understand that. <laughs> I can understand the depth of their devotion to some degree. I see the way they lived, and history records in some cases the kind of pattern of how they conducted their affairs, and it's very easy to see why God blessed them in the way that He did. But at the same time, I find it much harder to do it, much harder to practice it, and it's the same for us all. We look here at Hezekiah. We see what he did. We admire it. We could preach a series of sermons on the life of Hezekiah and his reforming work as a man of God leading in Judah. But, but to do what he did, that's the difficulty. That is the struggle. Men will seldom see reformation in others before they reform themselves. There must be a reforming of ourselves before we see change in others. And I have to keep that, and as I was putting that together and thinking about it, I was thinking that, that, that strikes home to me because as a, as a preacher of the Word, I must see the Reformation take place in my life before there ever can be the real work in your life. I believe generally that is the way God works, generally, not as a hard and fast rule right across the board. Sometimes, and often it is the case, you'll find that there are people, individuals in a congregation, and they're more godly than their leadership. It's quite possible and often is the case. But generally, generally, the very, the gist is very, the, the, of the, the, the kind of general uh, temperature of the spirituality of a congregation will, will only reflect that which is in the heart of the pastor. So that comes to my heart. But it's so for you who are a parent as well. If you're looking change in the lives of your children, there must be change in your life. There must be reform in your heart. There must be. Asking your children to do something that you don't do faithfully. Or asking them to change when you won't change. Just kind of saying, well, I've, a, I've achieved some degree of what I think pleases God, but they have to learn to do this and do that and do the other. That is not, that is not ever allowed by the child of God. And our lack of forward progress, the lack of challenging our complacency, will lead to a complacency in those that we want to see change. But when they see us lead by example, look how dad, look how mom, look how these individuals take so seriously obedience to God, it will be a lasting memory in their mind and may be the very thing that will move them to take seriously the things of God as well. Oh, it's so easy. Hezekiah did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and it was manifested in a particular way. If you look at verse 6 again, he departed not from following the Lord, but kept his commandments which the Lord commanded Moses. That's how he did right. He kept God's commandments as given in the law of Moses. Those things that Moses had penned and written down, Hezekiah gave himself to them. Now, in the reform, we must notice a couple of things that First of all, in the reform, he removed what God hates. He removed what God's hate, God hates. Look at verse 4. It tells us, he removed the high places and break the images and so on. We just want to deal with, with these uh, a step at a time. First of all, he removed the high places. What, what were the high places? 
And you'll read about this throughout the Old Testament scriptures, become very familiar with the phrase. But again, just to say, he did not get his example from anyone else here. There was no one before him who did this at all. It's very interesting to read through the scriptures and see the, the coming in of the high places. Now, the high places, just to give an idea of what they were, they were in the rural areas. Instead of the people going down to Jerusalem to worship, they created their own places of worship in kind of elevated places in rural areas. That's what they did. So there was hills or whatever, and they would assemble there instead of going to the temple. That was their practice. They made high places, places of worship outside the appointed place of worship. That's what they did, and that's what the high places refer to. And so they would meet there, but they, would, they wouldn't worship the Lord there. It was not given by God for them to meet there at all. They were meant to go to Jerusalem. And yet, over the years, as this practice had, been, had gone on, no one had ever addressed it. I don't know whether it was a matter of all the kings kind of looking at it and thinking, well, what's the big deal? They're meeting for worship. Let's not demand of them to do what the Word of God actually says. And so, even for as far back as Solomon, we read in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 3, And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. See, when we come to 1 Kings chapter 15 and verse 14, dealing with Asa, it tells us, But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. And what I'm noting here in these texts is men who were godly, who largely did what was right, but didn't deal with the high places. And the Spirit of God makes reference to the fact. It tells us that these men lived to a degree in obedience to God, and they did a lot that was right, but they didn't remove the high places. It specifies this shortcoming in their living. It tells us also in 1 Kings 22, verse 43, with regard to, uh, who's this? I'm not sure I haven't got the name down here who this is, but it was the son of Asa. He walked in all the, way, the ways of Asa, his father. He turned not aside from doing it, doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, so he does what was right. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for the people offered and burnt incense yet in the high places. Then we deal with Jehoash as well. In 2 Kings chapter 12, Jehoash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. All his days were in Jehoiada, the priest instructed him, but the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. And Amaziah, we read of him, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Yet not like David his father, he did according to all things as Joash his father did. Howbeit, the high places were not taken away, as yet the people did sacrifice and burnt incense on the high places. And then of Azariah, we read the same, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done, save that the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burnt incense still on the high places." Now, the, what I've just taken you through there is, is about a history of almost 300 years of kings in Judah. And in every case, those who were doing right, it gives us this, it specifies this fact that they didn't remove the high places, that they didn't deal with it. So even among the godly kings, there wasn't this example of dealing with the high places. And so the temptation for Hezekiah would have been, you can imagine, well, no one else has dealt with this before. I don't see it as being instructed in the Word of God, and so it's not given in God's Word, but no one else has removed it, and, and what's the big deal? We'll just, we'll just let it slide, let it go, not give our attention to that. We'll do everything else that we think God wants us to do, but, but we'll not deal with that, because some of these other men knew a measure of success, even though they let the high places remain. But for Hezekiah, that was not the case. And this is what I loved about the study here for this week. The, 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 the fact that there's this unrelenting desire in Hezekiah's heart that whatever God's Word says, that is what will be done. That there's no compromise whatsoever. It doesn't matter how long the practice had continued. He took heed to the Word of God alone. That was his rule for faith and practice. And there's almost a sense of arrogance and him going about this. When you think, well, Solomon did it, and Joash, and, and uh, all these other men that we've mentioned, they all, uh, these forerunners before him, they, they didn't deal with it. They, did, they didn't, and yet the record is given that they did that which was right and so on, but, you know, they didn't deal with these things. And so this upstart, 25 years of age, comes in and says, no, 
No, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to remove it. And no doubt to the outsider, it would have been seen as arrogant, but it was far from it. And that's often how the world reacts to someone who rises up and only does what God's Word calls them to do. Especially when they're young. Especially when they're young. And they look at them and they say, oh, that upstart, he's just a troublemaker or whatever. And look at him, he's 25 years old. What does he know? Does he not know that Solomon, the wisest man of all, he uh, had the high places there and he even went and participated in it? Does he not know that? What about all these other godly men? Who is this young troublemaker coming and taking away our high places? But Hezekiah only pleased one. That was God. He feared God to the degree that he did not fear man at all. What a thing to do. And just to apply it to the young people, do you see this, young people? <laughs> do you see this? Do you see the example of a 25-year-old? Now we have younger. There were kings who were younger than this, who, who went about and obeyed God. But I just want to apply, we're dealing with Hezekiah. He was 25. 25. Oh, he was a king. The world was his oyster. How much privilege he had. And yet, what does he give himself to? Pleasure? Fun? Just wasting away all the riches that he had as being the king of the land? No. He gives himself to obey God. And young person, that is your duty. Priority number one is not education, then a job, and then marriage, and then children, and then when all of that is organized, then I'll begin to live how I should live. No, that is not. That's disobedience, and that will bring you in a trajectory of life that will ruin you. Follow Hezekiah. Learn from his example. 25 years old, what's he doing? He is giving his heart to obey God, even to the degree that no one else before him had done after the high places had been brought in. He also break the images and cut down the groves. The groves were a bit like shrines. They cut them down as well. And then it tells us he break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. <laughs> wow, now you're, really, now you're really touching the sore point. Moses made this, Hezekiah. What are you doing? This is, this is a matter, this is a, a, a thing of veneration. And we, we, this, this was a blessing to us. Do you not know what the, serp, the brazen serpent did? It delivered our forefathers when they were bitten in the wilderness. And we must keep it, and we must respect it, and we must have it, and, and desire it, and even give homage to it. But not Hezekiah, no. <laughs> also a man after my own heart, no sentimentality. The sentimental one would say, well, look, I'll remove it, and I'll put it in some, like, glass case, and keep it away there, and, you know, do something like that. No, 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 no. Because he knows, if we keep this here, as soon as I'm gone, this stupid thing will come back out again, and I'll start worshipping it again the way they had done before. No, break it. Get rid of it. Destroy it. Remove it completely, because it is not the object of our worship. This touches our hearts, I think or ought to touch our hearts, when we think of the, the general application of something that was a blessing in the past and ought to be a blessing turning into a curse to us. And this happens in the Christian life, you know. It happened to Israel. Not only this, the Ark of the Covenant was the same, and there are other things as well that they, they gave too much allegiance to, and they didn't really turn to the Lord properly. They weren't worshiping God and this is just one example, and it drives home this fact that that which is a blessing to us can become a curse. You know, our families, parents, let me talk to you, your children that ought to be a blessing to you can become a curse when you worship them more than God. And God can take them away from you, and He can break them in pieces when you're giving more to them than you are to God. That's a frightening thought but it is real. The same goes for money. Money is to be a blessing. It's to be something that we can use. It's not evil. The love of it is evil, but money itself is not evil. It's a tremendous blessing. Without it, there's nothing can be done in the work of God, and, and the work of God is impoverished of its ability to go forward. Money is a good thing. It's a blessing. And the, the attitude of John Wesley was as earn as much as you can, save as much as you can, give as much as you can. That ought to be our attitude. It's right and honorable. 
But when it becomes a thing we worship, when we love it, then God can take it away. He can destroy it, remove it completely from us. In order for us to see that we're worshiping it, venerating it, instead of Him. Nations can be worshipped. And we ought to be thankful for the nations that we, the nation we live in, some of us, the nations we've come from, tremendously blessed, a heritage of tremendous mercies from God. But when we start worshipping the nation, you can be sure at the point where that is being done, God begins to carry the nation away into the hands of our enemies. And we can worship churches and denominations. And we can worship systems of belief instead of God. And it's wrong. It's always wrong. He will carry it away. <laughs> Start worshiping the church. Take the attitude that is rife among so many, especially denominations as they exist for a certain length of time. So if you're of the Orthodox Church, you're tremendously proud because you think you can trace your lineage right back to Christ and the apostles. So you're proud of that. Well, that's devoid of truth for the most part and leads people to hell. Same for the Roman Catholic Church. Same for many Protestant denominations. They, they have lost their way. They worship themselves. Their pride, their exaltation is in the name over the door, the place they attend, the place they're members of. And as soon as you start that, it's the beginnings of Ichabod, the glory departing, the removal of God's presence, the removal of the candlestick. We remove ourselves away from what we ought to be doing, and that is giving ourselves to God and God alone. It's so sad, you know, but history that records this in the Scriptures, it records it in church history as well. It ought to be a grief to our hearts when we give ourselves to worship the blessing more than the blesser, if we can use that word, and commit idolatry. When we do that, it needs to be removed. That's what, that's what Hezekiah did. <laughs> he takes away the high places, breaks the images, cuts down the groves, and breaks in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. Did he respect Moses? Of course he did. But he knew that he was on Moses' side. I'm on the side of Moses. Moses didn't craft this to be worshipped. It was meant to be a memory. Remember God's deliverance and our need to look to that one who would come as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that salvation is by looking to God's provision. We're bit with the venom of sin. We need salvation in a Savior. We must look away from ourselves to another. But it's not to be worshipped. So sad. When did Hezekiah start this reformation? When did he begin? Did he delay a while? Well, we're told in 2 Chronicles 29, verse 3, and we'll be turning there in just a moment. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. That's the beginnings. That's when he starts. The first year of his reign, in the first month. And dear child of God, when it comes to purging the things out of your life, removing what God hates, it must begin today. It must begin today. Of course, there's a time and a place for certain things need to be dealt with. And with regard to him doing this, he needed to wait for his, his dad to pass away. He needed him to die and get out of there so that he could begin the work of reformation. So there are certain seasons, but with regard to our personal life, we must begin immediately. But in the reform, there's not only the removal of what God hates, but very briefly, there is the restoration of what God loves. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles 29. 2 Chronicles 29. And to quickly just look at some of the things that it gives to us in this account of Hezekiah's reforming work. We don't want to just see the negative, the removal of things that God hates, but there must be the restoration of what God loves. Again, we read verse 3 of the chapter. In the first year of his reign, the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. So he gathers the priests and the Levites together. He begins to instruct them what he wants to be done. Move on down to verse 16, just to, to begin here. And the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord on, into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it to carry it out abroad into the brook Kidron. Now they began on the first day of the month of 
to sanctify. And on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And in the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. Then they went in to Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord and the altar of burnt offering with all the vessels thereof and the showbread table with all the vessels thereof. Moreover, all the vessels which King Ahaz and his reign did cast away in his transgression have we prepared and sanctified. And behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. So there's the negative. There's the removal, getting rid of everything that offends God. Now, if you move on to verse 31. Just quickly that we read here at the end. It tells us, Hezekiah answered and said, Now ye have consecrated yourselves unto the Lord. Come near and bring sacrifices and thank offerings into the house of the Lord. And the congregation brought in sacrifices and thank offerings, and as many as were of a free heart, burnt offerings. So here's the positive. They have removed everything God hates. Now they're bringing in what God loves. What does he love? He loves his people to be consecrated. That's the first thing. The individuals performing the worship of God to be consecrated individuals. And there will be a distinct difference in your experience in the house of God or in your own devotional times when you come before God with a consecrated heart. You can't enter into God's presence and all the fullness and joy of it when you come with a divided heart. It just won't happen. Forget it. Beloved, listen to me. If I know anything, I know this. Be consecrated to God. Don't hold back. Stop playing games with your spirituality, thinking that you're okay in some middle road way. We are to be consecrated. We are to surrender all, all to Jesus. I surrender. That's the kind of spirit these men came in with. So they consecrated themselves. That's positive. And they came near and bring sacrifices and thank offerings. Here they're bringing what they have, what they can to the worship of God in the house of the Lord. They bring them all, as many as were of a free heart, burnt offerings. They bring all this positively to worship God. This is the positive. This is obeying God's word in the positive. And this is required as well. So no point in just purging and leaving yourself empty. There must be the, the bringing in of worship, the bringing in of praise, praise from a consecrated heart. Tell me, are you consecrated? Are you? If you were to say to God, honestly, where are you? Are you on the altar or are you not? Are you playing games with your life or are you saying, Lord, everything I owe, everything I am, all that I possess is on the altar? There's degrees of that that I don't understand, but as far as great, the grace of God allows me, I've put my life on the altar. I don't want to have control. I don't want to be the dictator of my little empire. I want it all to be before thee. That's the spirit. That's the attitude. If not, we're half-hearted. We're not truly purged from our sins and filled with that which brings glory to the Lord. Thirdly, finally, the result of the purging. Well, there was, of course, and it almost barely needs to be said, but we'll mention it briefly, there was a purity in their worship. Obviously, they got rid of all the, the dross and the rubbish and all the unclean stuff that had gathered in the temple. As we read there in verse 16, they got rid of all that and brought, they allowed purity of worship. If they did not clean this all out, they couldn't have brought in the positive. It would have been no good. It would have been tainted worship. Christians try to do this, you know. They try to do this. They come before the Lord and worship. They come uh, both privately and corporately. They come before God and worship, and they try to make it purity of worship, but their life is full of uncleanness. It's not pure worship. It's not. You need to do the negative. You need to purge out. It needs to be the repentance, the removal, the reform. It needs to go out, beloved. It needs to go out. No arguments. Stop making excuses for yourself. It needs to go. It needs to go. There must be a purging. Forget about praying for revival. Forget about praying about anything unless you're willing to get rid of the unclean. We dealt with this a couple of weeks ago. For those who weren't here, go back and listen to the message two weeks ago to see the importance of this aspect of obeying the voice of the Lord in all things. Otherwise, our prayer life is a complete waste of time. God doesn't hear us because we don't hear Him. We need to purge it out. We need to take on board what He is saying, get rid of the unclean so that there may be purity of worship. There also was not only purity in their worship, but a presence in their lives. Back where we initially read in 2 Kings 18, 
we are told something about Hezekiah, and he's representative of the spiritual life that was being brought into the land at that time. It tells us in verse 7, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth. There's a sense, of course, in which the Lord is always with his people. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. If you're a child of God, God will never leave you. But in revival, in reform, in a move of God, there is always this sense of God making his presence evident. That's the difference, you know. When God comes down, when God's really here, and you've been in meetings just as I have, You've been in meetings where there's a distinct sense of God, a, a holy awe, a sense that the Lord has come. It's an awful thing, but it's a glorious thing at the same time. And to sit there in the presence of God is, is wonderful. And, and, and to, the point, to the point, when God comes in a real outpouring, everyone is aware of it. Everyone. Everyone is conscious. Everyone is unanimous. God is here. This, this is a holy place. And in an outpouring of revival, blessing, and God coming in a mighty way is evident even to the ungodly. And they become aware of it. The psalmist spoke about it. The Lord hath done great things for them. We're all there glad. There was a kind of this public awareness of the fact that, that God is with them. Of course, this was spoken of Joseph as well. You read Genesis chapter 39, repeatedly it tells us that the Lord was with him. And so he was blessed and he prospered as well. But... It was with him in such a way that could not be denied. Uh, th th that he, he totally turned away from all evil. And because you remember Potiphar's wife came and tried to lay hold of him. What was Joseph's attitude to pollution? What was Joseph's attitude to something potentially tainting his life? He ran. He ran. He, he did not hesitate. He did not dialogue with temptation. He ran. Is that what you do? Is that what you do? When stuff comes before your eyes, when you hear things and whatever goes on in your workplace or school place or wherever you are, do you run from temptation? This is a mark of one who takes seriously the purging. And whenever they've done the purging, they've got rid of all the evil, they've got rid of all the sin, then they don't want to be tainted. They're like jo Joseph. They're like, no, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And then when she lays hold on him, he runs. He runs. Hezekiah was the same. And you'll like Joseph as well. When he came eventually before Pharaoh, Pharaoh, this ungodly king of Egypt, he stands before him with the problem of the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine coming. And he looks at Joseph and he says, can we find such a man as this in whom the Spirit of the Lord is? I mean, it was evident. It was evident that God's hand was on Joseph's life. Very evident. So it was for Hezekiah. The Lord was with him. And it became manifest, he prospered whithersoever he went forth. God was with him. Well, there's a presence, you see, in the life when you get rid of the unclean. When you purge out all of those little things that you've made excuses for for years. You said that's not a big deal, it doesn't matter so much. No, no. When you start getting down to business with God, when the answers to your prayers matter more to you than the pleasure of your life, when you start living in that kind of way, you'll purge everything that you are even thinking may offend God. That was Hezekiah. That was Hezekiah. He got rid of the high places, absolutely everything. The brazen serpent, everything gone. Get rid of it. And so the Lord was with him. He was a clean vessel. He was a vessel of honor. Meat for the master's use. He purged out that which offended. He got rid of the leaven. What an example he is for us then. What an example. And you know most Christians won't do this. You know the difference between the majority of Christians and the minority, the difference is this. The majority talk about trying to live godly and trying to do what's right. The minority say they, they are determined to do it. They're determined. And that's the way they speak. And that's the way they act, more importantly, never mind what they say. They are determined. Hezekiah came to the throne. And it wasn't like, I'm going to try and reform the land. I'm going to try and reform the worship. I'm going to try and reform Judah. I'm going to try. I have all the desire to do it. No, that wasn't Hezekiah. Hezekiah moved from being like most people, I'm going to try to do good, to being determined to do good. He was determined. He set in motion something that he was determined to carry out. He wasn't worried about the naysayers, and he knew they would be there. He comes to the throne. Immediately there's going to be uh, voices of opposition. But no, Hezekiah, look, I don't care what they say. I have a purpose of mind. I have a purpose of heart. This is what I'm going to do. There's a trajectory. It's not my trajectory. It's given in the law of Moses. 
Purge these things. Get rid of that which offends God. It must go. He was determined. Are you determined? Tell me, is that, is that, most Christians here, no matter what I say, no matter how I preach, most Christians here are going to spend their life saying, I tried to do this and I tried to do that. That's a fact I have to live with, a fact that every church mostly these days has to live with. That's sad, you know. You look down on such potential. Young lives, older lives, every life. You look down, you see there's potential there. And yet they can't get away from this philosophy. It's just about trying. No, it's determining. Do you need a new plan? God has given the plan. He's given the blueprint. Seek his face. Repent of sin. Purge out the leaven. Stop playing games. There's also praise from their hearts. This is another result of the purging praise. Back in 2 Chronicles 29, I'll just read it to you, the very last verse of that chapter. Hezekiah rejoiced, and all the people, that God had prepared the people, for the thing was done suddenly. Oh, what a, what a tremendous thing. I tell you, that gives backbone to the preacher to see that God can come in such a blighted place and time and generation and work suddenly. But it brings joy, you know. It's not, it's not a matter for melancholy to purge out the unclean thing. It's not. That's the way most people think. Law, you're getting legalistic and you're, you're calling us to do this and do that. No, no, I just live in the joy of my sins forgiven. Don't kind of bring responsibility on me. That's legalism. And I'm not going to talk about that again. I've dealt with this before. That's not right. That's wrong. That's antinomianism. We are called on to holiness. Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. It's a call to us all. And it brings joy. You will never be more happy than when you're holy. Never. The more holy you are, the more happy you are. That is the rule of life. I've been 14 years on the road, and that is my testimony. The more I'm devoted to God, the more I'm giving myself to holiness and purity of life and obey, obeying God in every aspect of life, I am more happy and more content. It's the working of being at peace with God rather than being unsettled like the wicked who are like the troubled sea. Oh, we must tie this up. The time is gone. All this, of course, in Hezekiah's day was very public, wasn't it? He was dealing with the public temple and public worship, but it began in his own life. This was an outworking of what Hezekiah had done personally in his own life before he ever came to the throne. And so he works it out and does what the Lord had called him to do. But when we apply it in our own context, in our own personal responsibility, there's this fact, beloved, we are all the temples of the Holy Ghost, aren't we? That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. We are temples of the Spirit. We, we are to look at our own bodies in the same way Hezekiah looked at the temple of the Lord there in Jerusalem. And that it must be clean, the uncleanness must be removed, there must be a purging and a putting in of what is positive and right. There must be a purging, and there must be the adding of that which brings honor to the Lord. That's the way we're to look at our lives. We are called to drive out the Canaanites completely. C.H. Spurgeon says, We must not harbor traitors. It is high treason against the king of heaven. And it is, you know. If you could only just see sin and see the little foxes and the leaven as that, as our enemies, as traitors to the king of heaven... They're not just little things. They are traitors to the king of heaven. And we become complicit in that treason when we allow them space to grow and manifest themselves. And we say, it's not a big deal. No, no, that's treason to our king. We must not harbor traitors. We have been bought with a price. We're not our own. You don't belong to you. You don't have the final say. When you live as one who has the final say, you live like one who's going to hell. You're bought. Blood-bought. As I've said to you in the past, how much more does the Son of God have to do in order for you to see that you owe everything to Him? How much more? He died on the cross. He died an atoning death Purge us legally and to give to us all the power and privileges of the sons of God so we might be enabled by his grace to purge ourselves, as he writes, as Paul writes to the church at Corinth. Purge ourselves from all uncleanness. 
2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. I call upon you, child of God, this morning. Do not get comfortable in the company of sins only God can see. Such a life is that of a secret harlot. It is not the life of Christ. The old Puritan Jeremiah Burrow said, Take heed of secret sins. They will undo thee if loved and maintained. One moth may spoil the garment. One leak drown the ship. A pen knife stab and kill a man as well as a sword. So one sin may damn the soul. Purge out everything. Is the Spirit of God putting his finger on something? Is there something in your life? It's time it was gone. Get rid of it. Put it under the blood. And do a reenactment of Hezekiah. Purge it out. The Lord bless his word. Let's bow together in prayer.